to, to just rehash a little bit about uh, about, about the tuning thing because we didn't really go into detail on mm -hmm. it and I, I thought maybe we lack and just to the point you know, about the overall historiography of this you see people think because uh, you know you two make the point there and I put historical issues there's always two sides to it you know and in Ireland there is a large number of, uh, of historians who are in many cases very well paid but I can tell you this is it this is the other side of the equation Rory out there is the only person, apart from the, there was a book actually published after one of the inquiries in Dublin by a priest in, in Dublin. Apart from that, Rory's inquiry is the only person who's looking at some of these allegations and saying that actually this doesn't stack up or whatever. You know, there isn't an army of people doing this. You'd think there was, but there isn't. And I, and I know this because I, I've been ringing up people to try to, to speak at the seminar or whatever. And you'll find the very highly paid Irish historians that don't want to know. You know, to a very large extent, Eugene mentioned that they're, they're afraid of feminists, that they're flat out completely paranoid and afraid. Another issue is a lot of them are employed by the state. Of course, they're all employed by the universities who are funded by the state. But actually, as well as that, this commission that we're talking about here um, employs huge numbers of historians as well. And so they all hope to get employed in that. And I was actually talking to an archaeologist, uh, you know, a postcard archaeologist, uh, just a few days ago, and uh, he was saying that, but he wouldn't get involved in it because it hurt his career, and that's just the way it is. So people like there who might watch this seminar, think, well, where are the great historians, whatever? They, they aren't there. They wouldn't speak out in a matter like this. So, so I thought maybe I would just, just, just in case there's people tuning in who don't know about the tomb story exactly of what's going on here, I thought I might just, just give you a simple timeline to it. So, so obviously uh, you have. Uh, the Galway County Council, they, they, they amalgamated the, the, the poor law unions, 1921 to 22 or 3 or whatever, and they, they, they decided to create a specialised children's home for Galway, and they, they, they put it in, in Glenamadi first and then in Tune, and, and they just put abandoned children, if you like. It's a children's home in the same sense that you get an old people's home. You know, you put people in an old people's home, you know, state run old people's home, who can't be looked after at home or, or otherwise. And it's the same thing with children, it's a simple concept, although a lot of them would have been illegitimate as things evolved, because that's really, you know, why they were abandoned, if you like. So that's what it is. Even from birth? So. Uh, yeah, yeah he did. what happened was, from birth, you see, what happened was they set up a maternity unit within the children's home. So that, that happens about the 1930s, I think the late 30s. So that would be then from birth, yes. In that sense, it'd be from before birth, if you like, that they would have, you know, kind of been abandoned. Their own, their own families would have uh, thrown out the mothers, uh, the expected mothers. Unfortunately, that's what happened. Yes, they were abandoned. And you get all sorts of stories, children abandoned on trains, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's what it is, okay? That's what it is. It closes down 1961. So, so, so the, the Galway County Council set this up, and they, they asked the nuns to run it for them. So, so, so they're the overall managers, and they just ask this order to sort of, uh, you know, d d deal with the day-to-day -day issues. And then the nuns then had all this bureaucracy, and they would send down the great books to the county council, I think every month or something, and get it all signed up. And the county council also met in the children's home on a regular basis, the, the committee that ran the home. So that's it. They close autumn 1961. Now, then you have Catherine Corus, who's a, a local historian in, in the locality, and she was doing a, a course uh, on local history. She decided to do it on the, the children's home. So, so she, she comes along <clears throat> and she finds out from the local people the place of burial of the people of the children's home. She finds out this particular area, this recognised graveyard of the children's home. She goes back, she looks at that, and she compares it to a map from uh, about the 18, well, the number of maps, maybe 1880s, 1890s. Uh, on order survey map, and she puts one on top of the other, and lo and behold, the, the place that's the current uh, graveyard of the children's home, <coughs> I, I, it looks to be the same area as what's described as a cesspool of the old workhouse that the children's home was in. A cesspool uh, meaning a sort of a, uh, anyway, I'll describe a cesspool in a minute, but it's, it's, so if you look at the maps, it's true that this cesspool would take up with, say, about a third of the area of the current children's home, uh, of the current graveyard of the children's home. Now that's the origin of the whole business of Tune, in case people are wondering where does this come from. That's the whole idea, oh nuns through babies in a septic tank. It doesn't come from anything else, apart from maybe the Marasmus reference that Eugene talked about. In the death certificates it mentions Marasmus and has completely misunderstood by the purveyors of this. But otherwise that's it, it's these maps show the cesspool, Therefore, uh, nuns through, through bodies in a separate time. There's nothing else out there, no eyewitness or anything or documentary anything. 
So let, let's look at this for a minute, what, what we mean by those maps. Now, in, when the workhouses were built, 1842, I think, 1842 in this case, uh, they, they, had, they didn't have a sewage system at all. The, in case people are wondering, of course they didn't, because they didn't have running water except a pump in one of the yards. Now, you can't have a sewage system unless you've got pumped running water, which they didn't have when they built it. So it starts off without a sewage system as we understand it. It had what you might call, in simple terms, a hole in the ground. That's all it, that in various places. We call them latrines, whatever. It's just a glorified hole in the ground. You have your toilet on top, stuff goes down, and you clean it out periodically. So they cleaned it out periodically, but then they found the necessity to create a, a, a structure over ground to, to hold it in case you get huge amounts of rain. In other words, if I pile sewerage manure in a corner of a field, the, you know, rain comes along, it all gets messed up because, you know, so all they do is they create a kind of a square on the surface of the ground. That's all it is. It's a square, like walls that high, we'll say, surrounding that area like that. And, and then they come along with the arson cart, put the manure into it. That's what we mean by the cesspool. It, 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 it's just, as I say, it's walls in the normal way of old stone cut walls, but also wattle, uh, you know, wattle, W-A-T-T-L-E, uh, intertwined in the walls in order to keep them waterproof, because they found that. In... So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the cesspool, right? It's an overground square box. It's all it is, just four walls. But, and so therefore, it isn't, it isn't really important to know that the structure occurs later in an area like that, if you think about it. It's a bit like you walk down the street tomorrow morning and you see, uh, you know, you see an area where they have put manure temporarily on the surface of the ground. A few years later, they take it away. You know, what's the big deal? I mean, you know, you could have anything underneath that ground later on and it just, just doesn't matter. And that, that, that's, that's the simple situation about the children's home. Now, they did have sewage later, and it gets complicated. There's another smaller structure where, where, where they did have sewage in this particular area. They found that in their famous excavations, and they didn't find um, any bodies in that area. So, so it, it gets kind of complicated. Anyway, she starts off this controversy. She, uh, and the other thing to point out, by the way, is that's the current graveyard of the children's home that she matches to this area where you have the... Uh, Accessible. The fact is that the original uh, graveyard of the children, so when the nuns were there, would be vastly bigger. It probably uh, goes the whole length of the bottom of the workhouse. So it's a vastly bigger area than the current children's home. In other words, you look at the current children's home graveyard, and maybe the cesspool is whatever it is, a third of that size. But actually, the real graveyard at the time the nuns were there is vastly bigger, and therefore there's no reason to believe that they buried anywhere near there. Anyway, she launches this, this inquiry. The hype is enormous. The government sets up a commission of investigation. Uh, it employs, uh, uh, employs archaeologists, historians, and a vast amount of lawyers. It's really run by lawyers. The, it, it's, a, it's a former uh, Supreme Court judge, or High Court judge, who's the, um, the head of it. The second is a fellow called Duncan from Trinity, another lawyer. It has, uh, the, these are the three members of the commission. And after that, the, the person who draws up the reports is another uh, barrister. So it's a very legal thing. Anyway, this commission hoovers up all of the information related to it. There are files within the National Archives on this home, etc. They seize them and they stop historians getting anywhere near them. Then they release nothing for about two or three years. At the time when there's a huge media hype about it and where really people come away with the impression, which is a totally wrong impression, then they issue one page statement, a totally mischievous PR job deliberately to hype up and to fuel this hysteria, in my opinion. You should just one page completely misleading statement in about, whatever that is, 2017. And then they shut up shop again. And then only in, I think it's whatever it was, March of last year, did they release anything we're talking about. Then they released a huge, um, a huge uh, documentation, about five, 600 pages, because of the great detail. And, and hopefully I've been able to address their, well, what they come up with in this book. So, so, so the, the idea behind this seminar is that, you, you see, that there is other uh, talks out there where, where I, I, anyway, have gone into great detail on this, and I, and, I, and I wasn't going to just repeat what I'd said there. So if you go on the internet, type up Tune Book Launch Riot, you'll see a very long lecture on the subject. And, and if you're interested, you can, you can read, read my book, it's called uh, Tune Babies, and they, that goes into great detail as well. So, can so you just hold it up again? Yeah, oh yeah, it's just, just that there. 
Because unfortunately, uh, it's kind of a rabbit hole, and people go down it. Up to two babies. Yeah, up to two babies. Yeah. Very huge. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, that, the idea was that, that I'd answer uh, questions that are, because questions come up all the time, and a vast amount of it. So if anybody uh, wants to know anything about it, and, you know, I'll answer any, any queries that anybody can, can think of. So, but, but anyway, it's, it's, it's very disappointing, the historiography of this, for me anyway. I think it, it's just amazing. I mean, even the venues. I, I tried to organize this seminar in, you know, the venues that might be connected to the state and forget about it, like it's hopeless. And then there we even booked a venue in Dublin and somebody got, got onto the Archdiocese of Dublin and it ended up, we, we were thrown out of there. So, you know, if people think it's not so impressive, you know, for what we've done, it's, it's all we can do, you know. This is... This is guerrilla warfare, you know, <laughs> we're the guys without the ammunition. You know, the state has everything, the state employs a lot of these people and they keep them under great secrecy. So to clarify, the commission investigation employs historians and they're absolutely sworn to secret anything they see except what's revealed in these reports. And I'm telling you, they're very mischievously written, uh, these statements and these reports. So Are that, they beyond the reach of any FOI requests? Oh yes, very much so. Yeah, very much so. It's also beyond the reach, I think, of, of, of any type of legal court. It, it's set up under the commissions of investigation. It's a commission investigation, which is a totally separate legal framework. It was drawn up when Michael McDowell was uh, the justice minister a few, a few decades ago at this stage. And it, and it has been used against the Catholic Church very extensively. But it is absolutely astonishing. The, the legal framework behind the commission investigation. You're talking secrecy, you're talking, you know, official secrets act virtually for anybody to reveal anything about it. So it's people, people in their mind's eye think public inquiry, you know, but that's not what's happening, not by a long ways off. This is hoovering up all the information, putting under lock and key. Look, put under lock and key. There's a proposal was before the doll only a few weeks ago for more, a new legislation to make sure that the, any evidence that this commission has come up with will be locked away for another 50 years or something. It was actually proposed just by the new Minister for Children uh, just recently. So massive secrecy. And all you get is whatever they're going to tell you. you know. Interesting, because uh, you, you might expect that if this um, administration, which is, has not been very uh, sympathetic to church, um, people or um, you would imagine if, if there was anything of, that they could have over the church that they would publish it as quickly as they can. But it's almost that they're trying to, that they know that there is nothing out there and they just want to um, stop anyone actually finding out the thing. Yeah. yeah, I think it's postponed again. I thought the final report was going to be published at the end of October. I think it's postponed now until next April or something. I just at the end of September, I just saw today saw something on the internet that it's been postponed for uh, until next April. Oh, the it's, it's unbelievable. It's yeah. forever. You're right in what you say. They couldn't find anything, and they have been stretching themselves to find every little bit. But that fifth interim report which you mentioned there was very good in yeah. terms of. It went through the timeline of everything they've done, all the archaeological investigations, everything's there, and still they have nothing. Yeah. Uh, I saw where. Um, okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they, well, you see, it's like, it's like the Feast of Famine. What they do is they only issued that statement, and what, which are very, absolutely no details whatsoever, yeah. and then you have giant speculation on no facts. Yeah. Then they produce giant amount of facts all of a sudden, but yeah. none of it does. You know, you know, obviously just to swamp people so you never actually get to the bottom of what's happening. And not one of it was to do with abuse, it was all to do with archaeology and, yeah. and all the rest of it. No yeah. evidence of it whatsoever. And the archaeology didn't find anything else. Yes, no, it didn't. Yeah. So, uh, so anybody want to say anything else? Or, 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 I'll just make one other point. Yeah. I don't know if you want me to make it on camera now or not. Yeah, go on. But the Chum home was by far the biggest home in the country. It had the biggest catchment area. If you calculate it out, if you do a little bit of history research, you find it was the biggest home in the country. It was also dealing with the poorest of the poor. Yeah. It was the poorest region of the country. County Galway in those days, the poor, the poverty of the county, and, and Mayo as well, was included. Yeah. And the poverty of the people is just astonishing. Nobody today can understand just how poor people were. Yeah. And it was the poor people that wound up in there. 
the middle class and the wealthy all dealt with problems of, of unmarried mothers differently. Yeah. They could send them away, they could afford to hide the problem away. These were people who were high risk in terms of health as well. And the fact that there's a high, what appears to be, they make a big of nearly 800 children buried. And there's not 800 children buried in, in that particular cemetery, they couldn't be. It was because it was the biggest institution. And versus the number of residents that went in and out through that institution, it's not anything, it's quite normal for the time. There's nothing unusual in that statistics. Yet it's just been overblown. And, and isn't it astounding? We have so many historians in Ireland, and they can obviously see that that, that thing, for example, about Marasmus is total nonsense. Yeah, of course. Well, why don't they come out? You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a very depressing insight, actually. No, I, I heard that way back in 2012 or so, I think it was on Sean O'Rourke, yeah. and had some person who was calling himself a historian, and he was coming up with this nonsense. Now, I happen to have an interest in medicine and historical medicine, yeah. and I knew that it was rubbish, but Sean O'Rourke gave him a lot of, lot of credence. Yeah. And I heard, it, I heard, heard it published since then. But I've never heard anybody to go on the radio and say, hold on a minute, that's not right. Yeah. You know, I, I, and why me? I'm not an activist, I'm not a political activist, and I'm not doing this for to promote any one of my own personal um, yeah. political aims or anything like that. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm astonished yeah. that my fellow historians yeah. are sitting on their bum and allowing all this to go on. Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. And they're making money out of it. They're writing books and making money out of it, and they're appearing on television. And they're, it's in all the public, it's in the press worldwide at this stage. That's your story went worldwide. Yeah. And it's, it's completely untrue. Why on earth are so-called well, intelligent people making such stupid claims? Well, I know one, one reason. I, um, I spoke to a journalist, actually, one of the very few who had defended uh, uh, unjustly accused 